Would you give a wonderful ACC warm welcome to Bill and Pam Farrell? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> It's always so nice to come back. Um, we, our son, got married in this church, Yay. and so it always in July. A special... By the way, yes, right. It wasn't exactly winter weather here in July when he got married. Yeah, <laughs> but things are on <clears throat> sale half price. Yeah, it's great. In July and <laughs> yeah, so it always has a special place in our hearts, as do you. And we've um, come back to visit about every four or five years to speak for one event or another, and it's so exciting to see. Every time we come back, there's new faces, and there's new programs, and there's new buildings. And so you as a congregation and your pastoral staff are doing such a terrific job touching this valley. So way to go. Mm -hmm. And Pastor, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And, and thank God, well, wasn't the choir and orchestra just fantastic? Yeah, it's always great to hear our Savior Beautiful. honored and glorified through the gifts and talents of His people. And um, that, that was just great to hear. And we know that, um, you know, Christmas is a time of, it's great celebration. Um, it is a time of gathering together with family. It's a, it's a great time of building memories together with the people that you love the most. But the challenge in celebrating Christmas with the people that you love the most is that everybody you love is imperfect. And so they come along with these, these kind of quirky characteristics. Like, I don't know if you heard about the little boy who was, he was getting ready for Christmas, and he decided it would be a good idea to write Jesus a letter about what he would like for his Christmas celebration. And so he started a letter. He said, hi, Jesus. I've been really good all year. He stopped and he scratched that out. And he said, Jesus, I've been really good for the last six months. He stopped and scratched that out again. And he said, Jesus, I've been really good for the last month. And he just scratched it out and he put his pen down got up from his seat, and he walked up to the nativity scene that they had at their house, and he grabbed the little statue of Jesus' mom, went back, sat down at his desk, and said, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mom again. <laughs> and it's just a good reminder that everybody we love just, just comes in perfectly, and so we have to learn how to have wisdom in our relationships with the people we care about so that we can stay positive in our love for those people. And, you know, when you are in relationship... Um, grandparents, parents, grandkids, great-grandkids. You know, Christmas is all about family. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you think, oh, isn't that so sweet? Like Bill played football. Uh, that's a picture of our son Brock when he was little and he loved football. And now he's a football coach at Chandler High. And, um, and his little son, um, Rocco, his first words um, when he woke up the first morning I was here was, uh, football, football, nana, football, football. And so it's wonderful when you see those fun traits pass from generation to generation to generation. But if we're not careful, some of the negative traits can pass from generation to generation and to generation, and it can unravel those families that we care so much about. Because we really are human. And um, in our bestseller, Men Are Like Waffles, Women well, Like Spaghetti, we kind of sum it up like this, um, how human we are. If I say something that can be interpreted two ways, and one of those ways makes you sad or angry, well, I meant the other way. That's right. <clears throat> and oftentimes, we just have these flaws in us, and we don't mean to hurt each other, but we do. Mm -hmm. So Christmas really is a picture of the gospel. And if you ask us, Pam and Bill, what's the one thing? What's the one decision that you've made um, that has given strength to your marriage for 34 years and given strength to your family and passed that baton of faith from generation to generation. The one good choice that we feel like God led us to was Christmas is forgiving. That's right. And there's a pretty stunning verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, that says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And the first time I read this verse, I was kind of stunned. Um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and so a lot of this stuff was new for me. And I, I read this verse, and I was stunned for two reasons. The first reason I was stunned is that I, I had a list of people in my life that I didn't really think deserved to be forgiven. And yet this verse said I'm supposed to forgive everybody for everything. And it created kind of a crisis in my soul. I was like, okay, well, if, if God really wants me to do this, I need to figure out how to live this out. And the second reason why this stunned me is, is for some reason when I read this verse, I realized, you know what, this is what Christmas is all about. 
You know, up until uh, th- that point, Christmas had been about a little baby coming to earth and giving presents to one another and, and being happy and eating lots of food. But I realized when I read this verse that, wow, Jesus came as a baby so he could accomplish the greatest need on earth, which is the, the need for people to be forgiven. And that because we have Christmas, we can have Easter, and because we have Easter, we can have eternal hope. And so I've come to the conclusion that one of the greatest skills we can learn as Christian people in life is the skill of learning how to forgive other people so that our heart stays clear to celebrate this life that God has given us. And so Pam and I have been on a journey for the last few years trying to figure out how do you live this out? How do you make this a reality in your life so that it's normal and natural and effective? And we'd like to share with you this morning what we have learned on our journey. But first you have to know what forgiveness is not. And forgiveness is not just like letting it go, because we've seen people don't know how to let it go or where to let it go. What do we do with this bitterness? So it can't just be like letting it go. That's right. And forgiveness is not saying it's okay. We have this bad habit in our world. When you apologize to somebody, people often say, oh, it's okay. Well, there's some things in life that are not okay. There's some things in life that should have never happened. And that's why forgiveness needs to be in play is because there are some things that have been done either by us or by others that weren't right in the first place. They shouldn't have been done. And so we need to learn how to say you're forgiven rather than just it's okay. And forgiveness is not just sweeping stuff under the rug. A lot of us come from dysfunctional families and we go home for the holidays and there's this big purple spotted elephant of an issue Mm -hmm. and nobody really wants to talk about it. Everybody just kind of dances around the elephant. And that usually means that the most dysfunctional person in the family runs the holiday, or I usually say ruins the holiday. Mm -hmm. And um, so it can't just be sweeping stuff under the rug and like, let's pretend like it didn't happen. Um, That's not really forgiveness, Um, that's denial. And if we sweep enough emotional stuff underneath the rugs of our life, it's going to come out in weird ways, like overstated anger over a small infraction. And people are like, whoa, what's up with her? Well, what's up with her is somebody just triggered that past hurt and this huge elephant just popped out. And so the emotions are accompanying all those years of pain, not really that small infraction. And so forgiveness deflates those elephants. And forgiveness is not forgetting. We have this cute little phrase in our world, forgive and forget. Um, Folks, if you choose to forgive, you're not going to lose your mind. It's not like you go stupid and your mind stops working. You are going to remember what's happened to you, and you really should. Because if you don't remember what happens, you're likely to be victimized again by the same kind of behavior. But what happens when we choose to forgive is God gets involved in the story, and He starts putting His fingerprints on it. He starts reworking the story. And the story that used to be about disappointment and hurt and pain now becomes a story of, look what God did. It becomes this story of of, of amazement and this story of marvel that is really what Christmas is all about. You know, in in a small part of the world, in a a bed that nobody would normally sleep in, uh, in, in an inn that had no room... We have the Savior of the world who comes to earth, and angels show up, and and we're rejoicing. So God takes the ordinary things in life, takes the difficult things in life, and He transforms them when we choose to forgive. And so it's not reconciliation either. Forgiveness and reconciliation are actually two separate things. What forgiveness is, is forgiveness is a choice of your will. It's not an emotion. You'll Mm -hmm. never feel like forgiving. It's a choice of your will to not allow anyone else to control your emotional well-being except for God. It's a private vertical act between you and God. Or reconciliation is actually a horizontal act that happens between two people to restore a broken and hurting relationship. And reconciliation is a whole lot easier if both individuals have first walked through that private vertical act of praying through those issues before God and then you come back together to talk and try to restore that relationship. Okay, so that's what forgiveness isn't. Um, Let's talk about what forgiveness is. Now, Pam and I, we decided if we were to take the greatest example of forgiveness on earth, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we were to apply it to interpersonal relationships, what would it look like? If we took what happened on the cross Mm -hmm. and applied it to any relationship, what are those six steps that will help us, those six statements that will help put handles on forgiveness? And um, we have a little worksheet if you want to take some notes um, as you go. It's in your bulletin. It's also in Men Are Like Waffles and Like Spaghetti in an expanded form. 
But these simple statements, if you can walk your way through these six statements, um, it shows you that you have gone through the process of forgiving. Because sometimes forgiving is, we just like know we're supposed to do it, but just we don't know how mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, open up to, to Genesis chapter 45. Um, we're going to be showing you an example of how these six statements work out in one of the greatest stories in the Bible of forgiveness that, that exists. Okay, so Pam, what's the first statement? I forgive, and you name the person for <coughs> the offenses. And the more specific you can be um, in naming those offenses, the more specific the healing is that God can bring to your heart. For example, you wouldn't want to say, I forgive my husband for being a jerk. That's, right. That's like too broad. Mm -hmm. You want to like list off the jerkiness so you know what it is that you're mm -hmm. forgiving. <clears throat> and then God can come deliver hope and help and healing in each one of those individual areas. And this statement is based on 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, and so the, the key to this one is to be specific. And, and Pam and I thought, well, if this is truly a biblical model here, there should be an example in the Bible where we see it played out. And one of the most dramatic moments in the Bible is Genesis chapter 45, where we have the reunion of Joseph and his brothers. And if anybody on earth has a, a case to build for being bitter, it is Joseph. I mean, I don't know what possessed him as a young man. I, like, I'm the youngest in my family, and, and he was 11 of 12 brothers. I don't know what possessed him to go to his older brothers and say, hey, guys, I had this dream, and in this dream, I was in charge, and you were all bowing down to me. Isn't that great? I mean, I'm pretty sure how that would play in my <laughs> home if I announced that to my older brother and sister. I would not be the most popular guy in the room. And it turned into such jealousy that they actually sold him into slavery, lied to his dad about what had happened, and proclaimed him dead in their family. And 20 years later, after 20 years of kind of this roller coaster ride of him proving himself and then getting falsely accused, and then proving himself again and being forgotten, left in prison for nothing that he had done wrong, and 20 years later, he finally rises to this place of prominence where in Genesis 45, he is the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation on earth. And his brothers come to him and they need what he has. And the challenge for all of us is what would we do in this situation? And in verse 4 of Genesis 45, we see that Joseph has accomplished forgiveness in his heart, so he's able to relate to his brothers. Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. Can you notice how specific he's being? What he's in essence saying is, guys, I have forgiven you for selling me into Egypt. And the second statement is, I admit what was done was wrong. We live in a world that doesn't like to say anything is right or wrong because that's not politically correct. But if nothing's been done wrong, then there's nothing to forgive. And maybe it's just our bad attitude that needs adjusted. And if we're wondering if something is right or wrong or whether it's an attitude that God needs to adjust on our part, we can look to the Bible. The Bible is like a plumb line from heaven. And God will show us, yes, this is something to forgive or mm -hmm. nope, this is your attitude and we're going to work on that together. Right. And in, in chapter 5 of Genesis 45, Joseph says to his brothers, now don't be worried or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. And the reason why he says to them, don't be worried or angry with yourselves is they should be worried mm -hmm. and angry with themselves because everybody in the room knows that what they did was wrong. And this is one of those gritty steps we take. If we want to master forgiveness, we have to be willing to admit that some things that happen here on earth are wrong, and that's why they need to be forgiven. The third is, I will not expect that person to make up for what he or she has done. A lot of times we live our lives on hold, waiting for the person that wounded us to come back, throw themselves down on the ground, begging our forgiveness. But chances are they may never do that. And even if they do come back and say they're sorry, is there anything they can do to take back those initial words? Nope. Mm. Take back those actions that hurt? Nope. A lot of times people are like, what? I'm supposed to just like let them off the hook? Mm -hmm. And what we encourage people is take them off your hook and put them on God's hook. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. God is all-knowing, almighty, all-powerful. So he has all kinds of ways to make somebody totally miserable and repent better than you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and... Um, 
In, in chapter 45, verse 6, Joseph said to his brothers, For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the, in the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. And so what we see in Joseph's heart is he's already determined, you know what, for me to forgive my brothers, they don't have to do anything because God's way ahead of us on this. And here he announces it to them. Guys, don't even try. Like we all know that what you did was wrong, but let's, it's time now to move forward in the new plan that God has for us. And the fourth is, I will not use what has happened to define who that person is. A lot of times we say, that's the person that ruined my life. And if that's the person that ruined your life, that makes them the victimizer. And what does that make you? The victim. Victim. And who <laughs> wants to go through life with the victim mentality? I don't. Set mm -hmm. yourself up to be victimized all over again like a doormat. And so um, God has said, nope. I want you to define that person like I define that person. Look that person through my eyes. That is, they're just a person, and they need me. And that's why they're making these bad choices, because they need me. And when we can see somebody through God's lenses of love, then it shrinks that monster down to size and makes them just a person. And we can deal with a person. Mm -hmm. And again, go back to verse 4 with me again. When Joseph refers to his brothers, he says to them, I am Joseph, your brother. That's a very vulnerable step for Joseph to take because, again, he is with the people who have hurt him the most in life. He is the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation on earth. He could have easily referred to himself by his position. He could have easily referred to himself by his authority over them. Instead, he refers to himself according to God's sovereignty in his life. And it's a great lesson to all of us that if we want to accomplish forgiveness in our life, we have to define people the way God sees them. And the way God sees people is everybody on earth is desperately in need of God's grace. If they don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they desperately need God's grace for eternal life. And for those of us that know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we desperately need His grace for everyday living. And anybody who gets away from the grace of God does ugly things. And so we're all the same. We're all in the same boat. That's why we can forgive everybody. The fifth is I will not manipulate that person with that offense. Um, this is you choosing to give up your right uh, to pull out in a heated argument. You know, I remember 75 years ago when you did this to me. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us, you know, struggle with using the past as a battering ram over people and um, one man said at our Waffles and Spaghetti conference, he said, yeah, um, I think that both genders struggle with this, but it seems like, you know, women, you said that they, because their minds are like spaghetti, they remember everything that everyone has ever done in like vivid technicolor. So I don't think that women are hysterical. They're like historical. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think both genders really struggle with this. This is you choosing to give up your right, you know, to beat people up and push people's buttons with the offenses that they have done. A lot of times we say to people, yeah, let's bury the hatchet. But then we keep like this roadmap to where that that hatchet mm -hmm. has been buried. Mm -hmm. And so it's giving up our right to um, use the past and people's mistakes forever and ever and ever and ever to gain our way. And this one's the easiest to illustrate. Can you imagine the relationship you would have with Jesus if he chose to manipulate you with everything he knows about you? It would be completely unfair. Instead, he, he says, you're my, you're my son, you're my daughter, and I want you to reach out to me as, as your Abba Father. So it's a, it's a family relationship, not a manipulative one. And this, to me, is where Joseph really shines. In Genesis 45, verse 10, again, you have to put yourself in his position. You're the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation on earth. Your brothers have come to you, and they need the resources that you possess. You have the motive, the means, and the opportunity to do whatever you want with these guys. What would you do to them? And in verse 10, he says to them, you can settle in the land of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your sheep, cattle, and all that you have, there I will sustain you. For there will be five more years of famine. Otherwise, you, your household, and everything you have will become destitute. So he says, guys, I'm ready to move forward. I, I, I'm ready to take care of you. I'm ready to set you up with land and with food and with safety. Now, remember Pam told you that forgiveness and reconciliation are two different processes. Forgiveness is a matter of the heart. 
And forgiveness is what keeps us from, from letting bitterness have a seat at the table in our hearts. Reconciliation is putting relationships back together, and it requires a step of repentance on the part of the other person. And Joseph knows that. So he's announced to them, guys, I'm ready to move forward. I have forgiven you. I'm ready to reestablish this. There's just one thing you need to do. Go back to verse 9. Return quickly to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me without delay. (laughs) Guys, all you have to do to energize this is go home and tell dad. Can you imagine that trip home? You tell him it was your dumb idea. You're the oldest. You tell him. No, wait. You convinced all of us to do it. You tell him. Hey. And folks, they didn't, do, they didn't do memorial services like we do. You know, we'll get together when somebody passes away. We'll celebrate their life for a couple of hours, maybe up to half a day. Boy, back then when they had a funeral, it was a week long. There was wailing and moaning and crying and feasting and telling stories and celebrating the life of this person who passed away. Ripping clothes, sackcloth and ashes. And whether you think it was right or not, Joseph was his dad's favorite son. And so they went even farther in the celebration they would have normally. And now his brothers come back, hey, Dad, (laughs) remember Joseph? (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) He's alive. Isn't that great news? (laughs) And to their credit, folks... They. they did it. They went home, they faced dad, and they owned up to what they had done. And that's actually one of the ways you can tell when somebody is moving from toxic to healthy. Um, a toxic person, they'll ap- apologize kind of like this. Um, if there's anything that I've like ever done to hurt you, like, sorry. Mm-hmm. And the reason that that doesn't feel like very much like an apology is because that what they're really saying is, I'm so sorry that you're so stupid and thin-skinned that you took what I did as offensive. Mm-hmm. And so that, that didn't feel very good yeah, as an apology, right? Well, if somebody moves from toxic like that to healthy, they'll own their stuff. What I did was wrong. I am so sorry. What can I do that we could repair this relationship? You'll see some of those kind of things. And that's a good indication. We always forgive because that keeps our side of the door open for God to work. You know, we don't forgive because people deserve forgiveness. Actually, all of us deserve hell. We forgive because it protects our own integrity. It makes us people that can love lavishly and love the world with our arms wide open. Mm -hmm. We forgive because it's good for us. And the sixth statement of forgiveness is? I will not allow what has happened to stop my personal growth. This is you saying, yep, Bad things happen to good people sometimes. Yep, sometimes life is unfair. But I'm going to own my side of the issue, and I'm going to choose to get over this thing. If it means paying for some Christian counseling, God thinks I'm worth every one of those dollars. If it means getting into a small group and studying a Bible study about how to overcome this kind of obstacle in life, then I'm going to do that. If it means getting into a ministry like Celebrate Recovery and learning how to live a different, more healthy way, then I'm going to do that. If it means meeting with a pastor or a mentor, then I'm going to do that. Um, If it means, like, for me, getting into the Bible for three years to study who God the Father is so I could learn to trust men again, I'm going to do that. The junk stops with me in my generation. Enough is enough. I choose to forgive. This statement is based on 2 Peter 3.18. 2 Peter 3.18 says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And folks, the banner cry of Christian living is grow. You don't have to be perfect while you're here on earth, which, by the way, being perfect is not a real good goal, because if you did accomplish it, we would crucify you. Okay, so, so, so the goal is not necessarily to be perfect, but to be better a year from now than you are today, and to be better two years from now than you are a year from now. And when you get on that track of growth, you energize Christian living. And we see it in Joseph's life. In verse 8, he says, He has made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. And the point here is you don't give that kind of responsibility to immature people. So it's obvious that when Joseph was in prison, he was committed to his own personal growth so that when his day of opportunity came, he was ready. And the big problem with bitterness is it stunts people's growth. That's why we have a lot of people running around the world today. They're about 40 years old, but they're about 14 years old developmentally because they got bitter towards somebody somewhere along the way and they stopped growing as an individual and now life has become bigger than their personal character. 
And so the energizing part of forgiveness is to say, regardless of what's happened in my life, regardless of the disappointment and frustrations I have, I am going to become the person that I'm capable of becoming with God's, with God's grace. And that's when you really energize forgiveness in your life. And Pam and I would love to, to like kind of end the message here and say, hey, here's the theory, we wish you well. But this is very personal to us. Um, I, I am absolutely convinced that if we had not focused on the process of forgiveness and learned how it works, um, we would not have a healthy relationship. Um, I, I'm, I, we might have a relationship, but it wouldn't be a healthy relationship um, because of much of what we grew up around. Um, my parents, I, they love me as much as any parents have ever loved any kid. But there was a very strange dynamic in my home. My, my dad's one of the nicest men you'll ever meet. Like if you met him today, uh, I would predict it would take you about five minutes and you would, you would consider you could be a friend of my dad. My dad is so nice, though, that he often didn't, well, not often, he didn't intervene in situations in, in my home that needed to be intervened in. And my mom, she, she went through a lot of personal pain in her growing up years, and she tried to face it on her own. So rather than pursuing Jesus and getting help, she just tried to face it on her own. And as a result, a lot of fears took over my mom's life and became the, uh, a mental illness. And, and I became aware of it when I was in fifth grade. There were, there were four groups of people I couldn't know. I couldn't know black people. I couldn't know Jewish people. I couldn't know anybody whose dad was a doctor. And I couldn't know anybody whose parents were divorced. Because I was told those four groups of people were out to get us. Okay, so I started looking around and asking, are things like normal in my home? Because it was a problem for me. Because my best friend at the time was a Jewish young man. His dad was a doctor and his parents were getting divorced. <laughs> so now I'm on a need-to-know basis. And I'm wondering, are, are things normal in my home? And I began to realize things were different. Like we repainted the inside of our house uh, five years in a row because my mom was trying to figure out which color showed up bugs the best. Um, turns out it's baby blue if any of you are interested. Okay? <laughs> and, um, and then my mom started washing the flower beds around our house with bleach because she believed that would keep bugs and germs out of our house. And then she got afraid of cooking because she was afraid if she had food in the house that bugs and germs would get in. And then she got afraid of driving. And then she got afraid of people. And, and over the years, my mom just isolated us down to where the, the only people I spent time with were the five people in my immediate family. Like I was never allowed to be in a group like you growing up because you all are just too scary. And so groups of people were frightening to her. And so we, just, we didn't go to church. We didn't spend time with anybody but the five people in my family. And my mom disappeared into this really strange logic. Now, to give you just one example of the logic my mom lives with, my mom currently only eats white food because she has white skin. And, and I grew up around that kind of logic. And, um, and in high school, I was looking for a place to hide. And I figured out I was just good enough in football and basketball to start on the, those two teams. And so that became my refuge. And, and, and when you're a high school athlete, you develop this attitude. And the attitude is if you have a challenge, bring it on because we can handle it. Come on. So, um, so when my best friend said, Bill, you think you could work it out to spend the night at my house, and my dad wants to take us to a new movie yet that's out, do you think you could do that? Well, I'd, I'd gotten pretty good at manipulating my parents, and so I worked it out. I got to his house. I said, by the way, what movie are we going to see? He said, oh, it's a new movie out called The Exorcist. <laughs> but I'm a high school athlete. I can handle it, right? So I go to the movie. 30 minutes into the movie, I realize I cannot handle this. I had heard it was based on something true. Now, if, if I'm, th I'm thinking, if this is based on anything true, I don't see any difference between the girl on the screen and me. So if anything like that could happen to her, what would keep it from happening to me? And I left with no answers. And because my, my family is so isolated, I have nobody to talk to. But my mom grew up in Georgia, so we had a Bible in the house. I don't believe we'd ever unzipped it, but we had a Bible in the house. And I started reading the Bible because um, I, I, I thought, well, if anything will help, maybe this will help. And, and I was reading the Bible every night before I went to bed. I would take it to bed with me because I thought it was like a shield against the devil. Um, I'd wake up four or five times every night scared, looking for the Bible again. And I'd read a little bit more and try to go back to sleep. After doing that for a month, I came across 1 John 4, 4 that says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And all I can tell you, folks, the light went on. And I realized if I can get Jesus into my life, I'm going to be okay. And in May of 1976, I asked Jesus to be my personal Savior, to forgive me for my sins, and to, to begin rebuilding my life the way He wanted it to be. And the night that I prayed that prayer, I slept all night. First time since I'd seen the movie, and I went, whoa, this is good. And, and I've, been on a, I've been on a pursuit of Jesus ever since. And I came to Jesus because I didn't want to be afraid anymore. 
I didn't realize when I came to Jesus, he was going to give me new life. He was going to be new strength. He's going to give me a relationship with a wife that I could have never imagined. And, and, and then he led me through this journey of saying, Bill, if you're going to have a healthy relationship, you're going to have to forgive your mom. I, I remember the day that process started. I was in this high school Bible study. And those of you who grew up in church, um, you say some shocking things to new believers. Okay, I'm in this high school Bible study. This, this well-meaning young high school lady said, hey, by the way, did you guys know that men tend to marry women like their moms? It's like, no, no. I even prayed that night, God, if that's a rule, I'm staying single. But fortunately, when you give Jesus a chance, your life isn't bound to be, be lived by statistics because the Holy Spirit is strong enough to rebuild anything that you give Him. And I have, I have figured out, if you choose to forgive the people who have hurt you, God can give you back a life that will amaze you for the rest of your days. And I remember when I came to know Jesus in a personal way, I was eight years old, and it was because of people like you, my mom's best friend, saw the chaos that we were living in. My dad loves me, loves me, loves me, but he has a pain deep in his heart, and he chose to enter that pain with alcohol rather than a relationship with God. And so because of that, there was a lot of domestic violence in the home that I grew up in. But my mom's best friend, she invited us to come to church. And there at church, I saw what love looked like for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know the author of love, Jesus. And so one day I prayed, Jesus, please come into my life and be my best friend, my Savior, and my Lord. Because when I grow up, I don't want to have a house that's like this. It's out of control. I want to have a house that's full of love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. And P.S. God... If you could work it out, really love to marry a pastor someday. And God answered both those cries of that little girl's heart. And immediately he began to work these statements of forgiveness into my life just naturally. Right away he's like, Pam, I want you to forgive your dad for being an alcoholic. I want you to admit that some of the things that have happened to you are wrong. It's wrong that every time you get in the car, you're afraid that you're going to die when your dad's driving. It's wrong that as a high school um, cheerleader that you have to step over your dad who's passed out on your front porch in his underwear on prom night. It's wrong that as a 18-year-old, you hear your mom screaming in the middle of the night, help me, and you come running out of your bedroom, and you can't find your mom. You're thinking she needs rescue because your dad's anger's escalated. But you run into the garage, and there is your daddy trying to hang himself over the rafters of the garage. And you pull him inside, and you take the noose off your dad's neck, and you sit on him all night long, singing Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. Those, that's not the way a daughter should live. Mm. But Pam, if you forgive your dad, if you don't expect him to make up for those things, you know what? You're going to be a lovely person. Pam, I don't want you to define your dad as a no-good alcoholic. Instead, look at him through my eyes. As I began to look at my dad through God's eyes, I gained two things. I gained some compassion. I began to listen to my dad. My dad was the middle child of 12, never told I love you not one time that he can remember by his earthly father. Uh, my granddad, my dad's an alcoholic, my granddad's an alcoholic, my great-granddad's an alcoholic, like Coors runs through my family tree like sap. So I gained some compassion as I began to listen to my dad. And then I gained some clarity. How many of you like country music? Mm -hmm. It's okay to confess it, even in church. Mm -hmm. And um, I was raised on country music. And when my dad drank, it was like a really bad country tune. Like, I lost my wife, I lost my job, I lost a truck. And it just spiraled down and he would get suicidal. And so God said, Pam, I, you're contributing to your dad's suicidal behavior. Mm -hmm. So I want you to lay some boundaries down. And all boundaries are, are traditions that you set in place to give God time to reach that broken, unhealthy, toxic person and heal them so that they have a relationship to come back to, that they haven't destroyed everything. And so he said, Pam, I want you, when your dad calls late at night, he's been drinking, I want you to say, Daddy, I love you. Daddy, God loves you. Let me pray for you. I'll call you in the morning because that's when he could remember what you have to say. And Pam, I want, don't want you to manipulate your dad anymore. And this was a tough one for me because my dad was a very successful businessman. And so I would plan my life based upon um, my dad's guilt and shame. And one day I was in college and I'm like, mm, I don't have a thing to wear. I know, I'll get in my car, I'll drive five hours out on my way, and I'll go see my dad. I know he'll drink, I know he'll feel bad, I know he'll give me some money, a charge card, and I can buy some new outfits, Woohoo! And so halfway up the California coast, the Holy Spirit began to whisper to me, Pam, do you want to be the kind of person that manipulates somebody based upon their pain and suffering in life? <sighs> Not when you put it like that, God. 
And so I gave up my dad, right to my dad's wallet. Shortly after that, I met Bill at a leadership conference with Campus Crusade for Christ. We fell in love and we got engaged. And my dad was coming to town, wanted to spend some time with Bill. We had this great meal because my dad came straight from work, so he was sober. He's like, oh, I love Bill. And like to my dad, Bill, Billy Graham, same person. He just like <laughs> loves them. And so he's like, oh, I want to give you guys some money for the wedding. And so he named an amount. And so we went up to see, he said, but I want to write the check a few weeks later and then I can get to know Bill. And we're like, okay, great. We go up to see my dad. He's been out water skiing with his buddies. Well, he drinks Coors all day when he water skis. And then he always gets in a barbecue kind of mood. But when you start barbecue and you've been drinking a fifth of this and a fifth of that, what you really get on the barbecue is kind of like this burnt offering. And dad brought this unknown charred meat source in and he was oh, really upset. I'm like, daddy, it's okay. I didn't come to like eat your food. I just came to spend time with you. You know, I'll just call for pizza. Is that okay? He's like, sure, Charlie. So I call for pizza. The pizza came on. Whew, yay, regroup. But as we sat down, because my dad had been drinking all day, he lost his cookies all over the pizza, all over me. And I was like standing in front of Bill trying to save him from seeing the scene. Like you can do that. Mm-hmm. And... Um, <laughs> And I got the kitchen cleaned up. I got my dad cleaned up. I came back to Bill. I'm like, we need to just go to the park and pray because I know my dad is going to try to buy us off. But I don't want those guilt strings following us in. But I want to honor my daddy for being my daddy because God gave him to me. And so let's pray. And we decided we would only take the initial amount that dad had offered when he was sober, but we didn't expect a dime. The next day, my dad got up and he wrote out this big old check. I could have had like Princess Kate behind a wedding. And I looked at the amount and I tore the check in half. And I was crying. And I'm like, Daddy, enough is enough. Too many people have manipulated you based upon your pain in life, and I don't want to be one of those people anymore. If you want to give us the initial amount that you said, that is more than generous. But really, Daddy, the only gift that I hope you give me is to walk me down the aisle sober on my wedding day, which was a gift he did give. And my dad was crying that day because he said he felt loved unconditionally. And that is really what Christmas is all about is giving that kind of unconditional love. I know that we wouldn't have the marriage that we have had forgiveness, had not the cross come into our life. And to have our son here call us on Mother's Day a couple years back, Mom and Dad, we just went to this prayer conference, and we had to do our family trees, and we had to highlight all the sin that so easily besets us. And then we had to circle the things that your mom and dad and grandparents have worked their way through and forgiven. And he said, as I did that on that tree, I just saw the hard work that you and God had done by forgiving so much. And because of that, I've been able to live free, and my kids are able to live free. And to hear my sweet little granddaughter now, three years old, Callan, say, sing with me, Nana, ho-wee, ho-wee, ho-wee. That's only possible with forgiveness. And we want to give you that opportunity, too. So would you just join us in prayer right now? And what I'd like you to do is just, just pick out the easiest thing you can think of that you need to forgive. We all tend to start with the hardest thing, and then we get frustrated because it doesn't work well. But Jesus always starts with the easiest thing and works from there. So just the easiest thing you can think of, and in your heart say, Jesus, I forgive and name the person for and then name the offense that they committed. Then say, I admit that what happened was wrong. And I do not expect this person to make up for what he or she has done. I know that for reconciliation there needs to be repentance, but for me to forgive, they don't have to do a thing. And I will not use what has happened to define who this person is. They need your grace just like I do. I will not manipulate this person with what's happened. And if I'm forgiving myself, Lord, I won't grind on myself with guilt and shame. And I will not allow what's happened to stop my personal growth. I recommit myself right now to become the person I'm capable of becoming with your grace. And if there's anybody in the room who hasn't made the big step of forgiveness, maybe you've never asked Jesus to be your personal Savior, and you're thinking, today it's my turn. If that's you, just right now where you sit, just say, Jesus, it's my turn. I know I've fallen short of who you made me to be. I've said the wrong things, I've done the wrong things, I've thought the wrong things, and I've honestly believed I could get through life without you. But Jesus, I know you died on the cross for my sins. And I know you're alive today, so please come into my life. Forgive me for all that I've done wrong. Give me eternal life as a free gift and begin today making me the person that you want me to be. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen. Give the gift of forgiveness and it'll set you yep. free this Christmas. Merry Christmas, folks. Live free. God bless.